Welcome to uh, Social Psychology. Today, we're starting a new chapter. We're going to start the chapter on uh, what we call pro-social behavior. A simple way to think about pro-social behavior is just, it's just to consider it as uh, helping. It's, another, it's a fancy way of saying helping. Okay, We're going to talk about all of these things. We won't get to everything today, actually, but we're going to talk about what the goals of pro-social behavior are. Why do we help? Okay, why do we lend the hand to anybody? Okay, we're going to talk about all those things, like, you know, improving our basic welfare, genetic benefits, material benefits, social status and approval, managing self image, managing emotions and moods. I don't think we'll get to everything. And at the end, we'll talk about whether there is such a thing as pure altruism. We'll talk about what that is and if there is such a thing. <clears throat> okay, let's get started. So one reason we help, right, why we engage in pro-social behavior is to improve our welfare, right? To improve our basic welfare, to gain genetic benefits. So in other words, uh, we uh, have kind of, um, one reason why we help has to do with evolution, right? There is the evolution of help, okay? Research shows that basically um, we are more likely to help those that are genetically related to us, okay? Sounds selfish, but research does support that. And this has to do with inclusive fitness, right? It's uh, the ability of one's genes to survive in our own offspring, in our own offspring and in relatives that one helps. So by helping those that are related to us that share our genes, we are helping pass on our genes, okay? We're uh, promoting the survival of our own kind, our people who are like us. So it has to do with evolution. Helping a close relative promotes the survival of those genes, right? Whether you're helping, let's say an aunt, an uncle, uh, a cousin, a brother, a sister, you know, your own mother, your own sibling. Those are all people who are related to you. And research does support the idea that we are more likely to help those who are related to us. And I believe there's a graph that talks about that. Percentage volunteering to help. Just think of it this way, okay? How much are we likely to help uh, different types of people, people who are related to us in different ways? So those that are highly related to us in the red bar there, you can see that we're very likely to help them, right? Our parents, right? Our siblings, our own children we are most likely to help those that are highly related to us. High means that, that they are highly related to us, right? That's the degree of relatedness. And the percentage of volunteering to help, the, the extent to which you know, we would uh, help them. But you know, the, when we're asked, would you help this person? You know, <clears throat> about 70 or so percent of the time, we would be likely to help those that are our parents, our own siblings, or our own children, okay? They are highly related to us, we're more likely to help them than we are other people. <clears throat> and why is that? Well, we just talked about, right? By helping those that share our genes, we're helping promote the survival of those genes, survival of our own kind, so to speak. And parents share 50% of your DNA. So do your siblings. You share, you have half the same DNA they do. And your own children are going to share half the, your own, you know, the DNA that you do. So 50% genetically related, you're most likely to help those. Those that are moderately related, like your grandparents, grandparents share one fourth of your DNA. You're also very likely to help them. They're you know, related to you moderately, right? Those that are you know, related to you uh, slightly, a little bit less uh, would be your first cousins, right? You're less likely to help them, but still somewhat likely to help them. I wanna point out that you know, um, moderately related, I guess both grandparents and your first cousins, actually, you share one fourth of the, your DNA with them. They're all, equal, they're equally related genetically. It's just that your grandparents are usually more involved. So you're more likely to help them, okay? Uh, and those that are not related to us, right? Like an attractive stranger, look, I mean, it, what's that? Like 10%, right? About 10% of the time we'll volunteer to help them. They're not related to us genetically and we're not very likely to help them. So the point about this is inclusive fitness. We are more likely to help those with whom we share genetic material. 
right? Those that are genetically related to us. We are in essence helping promote the survival of our own genes, the survival of our own kind. It is a selfish way of helping. We're more likely to help those that are related to us. But that's what research says. So right away, we're finding out that helping or pro-social behavior is selfish, okay? We're less likely to help those that are not related to us. Other things, other reasons why we help is to gain material benefits, right? We, improving our own welfare. Yes, uh, often we also help to gain material benefits. There are things to be gained by helping others sometimes, right? There is such a thing as reciprocal aid. If you help someone, they're more likely to help you. Or you're more likely to help someone who has helped you in the past, right? That's the uh, norm of reciprocity, right? Or reciprocal aid. If you do something for me, I'll do something for you, okay? And research does show that people working for organizations who provide more benefits work harder for that organization. So if your workplace, if they help you by providing you good pay, good medical benefits, uh, you know, good, uh, you know, time off, you know, a lot of days off and free childcare, uh, the organizations that help their workers the most, that give them the most benefits are the ones that people work harder for. They help you, you help them by working harder. You help them by working harder and help them make more profit, okay? We help those that help us. That's another reason why we help. Again, selfish, right? We are helping for a selfish reason. Uh, but it is true, it does happen. When you work for a place where they treat you really badly, they don't pay you very well, they don't provide benefits or hardly anything at all, you're probably not gonna be so committed to that organization. You're probably not gonna work as hard as you could. And first chance you get at another job, you're probably out of there. They don't help you, you're only gonna help them a little. And as soon as you can get out of there, you're gonna get out of there, right? That's what happens. Treat people well, they help you, you help them. That's reciprocal aid, whether it's an organization or somebody who's helping you, right? You're more likely to help them, okay? And that's another reason why we help, we help people. And maybe one day we'll be the ones who need help. And those people are more likely to help us if we have been kind to them, if we have helped them in the past. All right, we're gonna talk more about gaining genetic and material benefits. So we're gonna talk about uh, learning to help, right? How we learn to help or things that have to do with genetic and material benefits. We're gonna talk about similarity and familiarity, how that influences helping. We're gonna talk about genetic similarity and need which we've already been talking about, okay? But yes, <clears throat> we're gonna mention those again. So learning to help, right? Um, and it has to do with genetic benefits. Uh, you know, uh, it turns out that uh, we're likely to help those people uh, who we've been kind of taught to help. So instilled beliefs matter, okay? Students, for instance, who have studied economics, learn more about the rules of self-interest. You learn about things like that in economics, right? You take economics, right? Supply and demand. If a lot of people want your product, you can raise the price, okay? And charge them more for it. That's economics, self-interest, right? If they really want something, you can make yourself rich by charging them more for it or get more money from them. If they don't want it as much, you have to lower the price so that they will buy it. Economics, you learn about self-interest. You learn about this me first attitude, right? I have to succeed, promote by my business and myself. And if I succeed, right, uh, it basically comes at the expense of others. I will outcompete others. That's what you learn about in economics. And that's also the case with the stock market and business in general. Selfishness, greed are considered a good thing when it comes to economics, when it comes to uh, the stock market, when it comes to business, right? The more you can accumulate, the more money, right? Uh, the more products you can make, the higher price you can sell them at, the better off you'll be. You will learn things like that, that you need to outcompete your opponent. Never mind cooperating, right? You need to outcompete them. You need to squash your opponent. Well, it turns out that according to research, students who have studied economics or things like that, where they learn about self-interest, learn about business, economics, how, how the stock market works and all that stuff, they're more selfish. They're less likely to give to charities, even when they can afford it. They're more likely to exploit their partner in a bargaining game. 
they set up a situation, an experiment where they have them, uh, you know, play a game with one another. And it turns out that those that have studied things like economics are more likely to take advantage of their partner and basically, uh, you know, demand, even demand like a lopsided payment, demand more payment for their services or demand more, not because they deserve more, but because they can. That's what you learn about in business and economics and things like that. What you're providing may not be that valuable, but if, you know, to mankind or to people in general, but if people want it, you can charge a lot more for it. Okay, like for instance, you know, uh, you're selling tickets to a game, right? A basketball game, let's say. Not really gonna do much good to humanity, right? But if a lot of people wanna go to that game, you can charge them hundreds or even thousands of dollars per ticket and demand that kind of payment if they want to see the game. And if a lot of people want to say want to see the game, they will pay that. If a lot of people don't want to see the game, you might have to sell the tickets for five, 10 bucks and not make a lot of money. You learn about things like that, supply and demand with economics. And it turns out when you learn things like that, when you learn about selfishness and greed and economics and marketing and things like that, you learn that you know it's not that good to help others and you don't. That's what research shows as opposed to people who study other things like the social sciences, people who study psychology, sociology, where they learn about the problems of people and how people need to help each other and be less racist and less prejudiced and to just be a better person. Those people are more likely to help. In general also, when uh, let's say uh, you, uh, you wanna get a raise, guess what? If your boss has a background in economics, in marketing, in finance, in business, they are going to be stingy with you. They are not going to want to give you a raise. They have learned that the, you know, the less they pay you, the better the organization is, the better they off, the more money they can keep for themselves, right? And they're not going to want to give you that much of a raise. And if they do give you a raise, it's going to be a small raise. If you have a boss that has studied other things, Maybe things have to do with nursing and the, and the social science, like psychology, sociology, where you learn more about the problems of people and how to help them, how to improve society. They're more likely to give you a better raise, in my experience. Different people learn different things. And some of those things make, those, make people selfish. Let's keep going. More about learning to help an expanded sense of we. Right? You're more likely to help others if you have an expanded sense of we. What does that mean? What do you mean when we say we? Right? If we means people like myself only, then you're not going to be very helpful. If we is more general, if it means you know, all mankind, if it means all living things, right? if it means all of us, no matter what we look like, what our ethnicity is, whether we're male or female or what our sexual orientation is, if we have a greater sense of we, we're more likely to help others. Studies have shown that children exposed to others of different ethnic and religious backgrounds develop a broader sense of we-ness, right? They have a more general sense of we. We does not just mean people like me. It means all kinds of people. It means us, right? It means all of us. Children exposed to more people like that, right? When they say we, right, they mean more people. They, 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 they mean uh, a more, you know, more types of people. And research also shown that, you know, the Europeans who helped, you know, Jewish people escape the Nazis, you know, around the time of World War II, who were those Europeans? They were the ones who were exposed to more ethnicities growing up than those that didn't help. Those that had a broader sense of we-ness, right? That were all human. We're all part of mankind and we should love and accept each other and help each other as opposed to those who are just brought up with their own kind. And basically when they mean we, they only mean people like them. They are less likely to help people who are not like them. They are sort of more narrow-minded in their thinking, right? So that matters, right? What do you mean by we? What kind of exposure have you had to people, right? The broader the exposure, the more likely you are to help others and people who are not like you. Let's keep going. Similarity also matters and similarity relates to genetics as well. Similarity in the past was a cue, actually still is, 
a cue to genetic relatedness. Our relatives look like us. Our relatives are similar to us. Your brothers, your sister, your mom and dad, people who are genetically related to you look more like you than people who are not. So similarity is helpful. You're more likely to help people who are similar to yourself. But even if they're not related to you, research shows that competitors in a negotiation game were more trusting of their opponent if their image had been morphed to look like them. So they had this competitive game and they showed a picture of the person that you're competing with. And in one case, what they did is they, uh, they basically merged the picture of, uh, of the participant and their supposed opponent. And they combined the pictures in a computer so that their opponent was made to look similar to them. And when that was the case, people were more likely to treat them better, more likely to help them, you could say, even though that person was a stranger. We're more likely to help those that look similar to us in general, okay? And again, selfish reason for helping, right? Why would we, would we be more likely to help those that look similar? Because they may actually be genetically related to us. In the past, you know, that was likely to be the case. Those that were similar, usually those, actually not just in the past, but just today, those that are similar, usually those that are related to us. There are often strangers who look like us. And it turns out we're more likely to help them too, if they look like us. And again, selfish reason for helping. It's like we're helping, uh, again, uh, promote our own genes because we kind of see them as similar and so they're more likely to be related to us, so we're more likely to help them, even if they're not genetically related. We think we may actually, they actually might be, okay? Familiarity is also important. Familiarity may be a cue to genetic relatedness, okay? Um, our ancestors encountered their relatives on a daily basis. So familiarity helps, right? The more familiar you are with someone, the more you're likely to help them. And in the past, that was very important. In the past, those that were familiar to us were more likely to be those who were genetically related to us because people lived in smaller groups, in tribal groups made up of families, basically, and their children and relatives. And, and that was more likely to be the case, okay? And so therefore, those that we encounter more often were probably those that were related to us. And basically, today, those people that we see again and again, we're more likely to help because we have that tendency. It's a biological tendency. It has to do with the evolution of help. Okay, those that are familiar in the past were those who were genetically related to us. Now, they're not necessarily genetic related to us. They could be anybody. But if we've seen them again and again, we're more likely to help them. In both animal and human societies, familiarity increases helping. The more we see people, the more familiar they are to us, not necessarily similar to us, but we have seen them again and again, maybe in class, maybe at church, maybe at work, we're more likely to help them because they are familiar than if we have not seen them before. Why? Because in the past, familiarity usually meant genetic relatedness. Familiarity is helpful. I can tell you a story, even uh, in animal societies, how that happened. There was, you know, I, I, I used to watch a lot of, I still do watch, um, you know, nature shows, shows about animals and things like that. Um, <clears throat> I remember this one particular, you know, documentary about this poor little elephant that had lost his herd, basically. He was lost and he was all alone. And he wandered around and he eventually found another herd of elephants. It was not his herd. It was not his family, but he found another herd of elephants. And he showed up there, and of course, they rejected him. They would chase him away, right? He wasn't part of the family. He wasn't part of that herd, you know, and they did that. And, but he kept coming around. And they kept rejecting him. Eventually, they accepted him. Eventually, they accepted this elephant. He became familiar. Well, I don't know if it was a he or she, but it was an animal, an animal, okay? An it, okay? Became familiar enough so that the herd accepted this poor little elephant into the family, therefore ensuring that this elephant would survive. 
That's familiarity. That's how powerful it is. It also happens with people. The people we see again and again, we are more likely to help. We're more likely to like people who we are, have seen again and again. We're more likely to trust them. We feel better with people over time. If we haven't seen them before, we're not so trusting and we're more on edge. We're less likely to help them. But if they're familiar, we kind of, after a while, we let our guard down a little bit. We start accepting them and then we're more likely to help them. It's another story that has to do with, uh, I don't, I don't know what his real name is, but he goes by the name of Slash, uh, which uh, he was the guitarist, uh, one of the famous guitarists of uh, Guns N' Roses, uh, an 80s rock band that eventually, you know, they eventually broke up. Uh, and then, you know, people went on and had other careers with other bands and other, other bands and stuff. But I, I've heard the story of how Slash became a part of Guns N' Roses. Guns N' Roses, the band, they were looking for a guitarist. And so they put out an ad and they basically, uh, you know, they tried people out. I wouldn't say they interviewed them, but maybe, but you know, they, people came over and, you know, they let them play and see if they could join the band, right? See if they would uh, let them join the band. Slash was one of those people that uh, showed up. And it turns out they didn't really give him the job. They weren't, they didn't really find anybody that they wanted to give the job to. They tried out several people. They didn't really give the job to anyone. But you know what happened? Slash kept coming around. He kept showing up to their gigs. He kept showing up. And basically, eventually, they let him in. He became familiar. And then they liked him and said, all right, you're in. You know. And then he became one of the most famous members of that band. Um, and then, of course, even when the band grew up, grew, I mean, broke up, he joined other bands and the guy's still around. And after that, he's that, if you ever seen him, he's that guy with the, uh, if you ever have watched The Simpsons, he looks like Otto, the bus driver. He has that long kind of curly hair and he wears that top hat or something like that. Um, and uh, yeah, that's his story, a little bit about his story. But yes, familiarity, right? The more you hang around, the more familiar you become, the more people are likely to help you. Let's keep going. Genetic similarity and need, okay? Uh, there is a ten the tendency to help relatives, right? To help those that are similar to us, right? Genetically related to us is actually stronger when help is crucial for survival. So if uh, lives are at stake, for instance, and you could only, and, and you know, well, you have to, you know, you could only help like one person or another, right? Uh, then you're more likely to help, of course, uh, those that are related to you. So like it's your brother or some stranger. Who are you going to help? You're going to help your brother, right? And this, the stranger's like, I'm sorry, man. I don't know who the hell you are. You know, I can't help you, right? I need to help this person. That's what research finds, right? We're more likely to help that the, uh, the tendency to help relatives, those that are genetically related to us, those that are similar to us, is actually stronger when it's crucial for survival when, when uh, it's just more important. Studies have shown that when it comes to everyday help, we're more likely to help relatives, right? Than those that are non-relatives. And when it's a life and death situation, the difference increases. We're even more likely to help relatives and less so those people who are not related to us. So again, selfish reason for helping, right? All has to do with kind of evolution here. Another reason, so one reason we hope is to gain genetic benefits. And that was what all that was about. Those similarity, familiarity, people who are related to us genetically, that's all related to the evolution of help, all right? It basically says that the reason we help people is because uh, we want to contribute to the survival of our own genes, so to speak, promote our own kind. Um, another reason why you help is to ga gain uh, social status and to gain approval from others. And we're going to talk about several ways to do that. The potlatch ceremony, social responsibility, bystanders, desire for approval, those around us, gender differences, things like that. Um, so let's get right into it. Gaining social approval. So another reason why we help people is because it increases our social status. It makes us look like we're actually better. It makes us look better. It makes, it, makes us look like we're more worthy, OK? One example is the potlatch ceremony, right? A, a ritual in which a host gives enormous quantities of goods 
uh, to guess. Um, it's basically where you know you invite a bunch of people over, and you spend all this bunch of money to feed these people and give them gifts and all this stuff, and you treat your guests really well. You help them a lot. You give them a lot. Why would you do that? One reason is is because that makes you look like a good person. It makes you look like you're someone important, someone worthy. Look at this person, right? You can afford to give us all this stuff, right? You can help us you know, with all this stuff, right? This person, he's awesome, right? Or this must be someone who's really rich and powerful, someone to be reckoned with, a high status person. It makes you look better. It's like a philanthrop, philan, it's hard to say that word for me, philanthropic act by a wealthy individual in modern society, right? It increases the status of the giver. Ever wonder, right, why rich people and even uh, organizations and businesses donate money to charity? It's not always because they actually are doing it out of the goodness of their heart. Often it is to make themselves look better. Bill Gates those donates a bunch of money to this. It makes him look better, increases his status. An organization, whatever it is, Enron, or AT&T or whatever it is, they donate money to some little league school or to some hospital or for research and cancer, whatever it is. What does that do? It increases the status of the organization. You're more likely to like that organization, like that person. You're more likely to think highly of them and then give them your business. Treat them better. A potlatch uh, ceremony actually increased the status of the caregiver, right? Um, and it doesn't have to be, you don't have to be a wealthy person or a business, individuals in general, right? What happens when you throw a party? If you throw a nice big party, you have lots of expensive alcohol and wine that's free, right? And you have a really nice cake and a live band. You spend all this money. Think about a wedding, right? Spend all this tons of money for all those people to celebrate, for you to celebrate with those people. The more money you spend, the more lavish the ceremony, the better it makes you look as the person who's hosting it, whether you're the parents or the individual. It makes you look like a big shot. And that's what it does. That's why people do it. And they spend all this money, often impoverish themselves in order to do that. There's plenty of people throw these big fancy weddings and they can't really afford it, but they have to because they need to look good. They need to look like a big shot. Or in you know uh, Latin communities, right? The, the quinceanera, in uh, for those that speak English, that's similar to uh, you know um, like a sweet sixteen. This big party to basically say, hey, my daughter is almost a grown up. She's turning into a real woman, and we're gonna throw this big party for us to you know for her and for us to celebrate. The bigger the party, the more money you spend, the more lavish it is, the better the family looks, the better that the parents look. And also, of course, the quinceanera or the uh, girl who's uh, having her sweet 16. That's why they do it, right? You're in essence helping all those people, feeding them, entertaining them, and it makes you look good. That's usually why they do it. So in other words, still selfish, that's why you do it. You do it so you can look good, so you can increase your status. And when you have more status, by the way, people treat you better. And often you, when you have higher status, sometimes you get more from the people than you give them. And it's sometimes sad and sometimes even unintentional. When I was younger and poor and I couldn't really afford anything, believe it or not, uh, I didn't get gifts like at Christmas time other than from my immediate family, my aunts, my uncles and all that stuff. Now nah, they give me anything. After a while, hardly anybody gave me anything. You know, I'd get something from my mom and that was about it. And as I got older, went to college, you know, established my career. Now I'm a lot better off. And guess what's happening now? People treat me better. People actually give me gifts, even though I don't really want them. I don't expect them just because now I'm higher status. Now I'm upper middle class, so to speak. And because of that, my uncles treat me better, my aunts. And that means that, you know, 
if it's my birthday, they might give me something or my kid's birthday and stuff like that. And they want to help me. They want to give me things. Why? Because I have higher status and they basically are the thinking, whether they realize it or not, whether it's unconscious or unconscious, is that this person has more. And therefore, if we're nice to this person, he'll be nice to us and help us. And that's usually the way it goes. It's also the norm of reciprocity, right? But social status, yes, uh, right? People who are, people often can increase their status by giving to others. And even when you have greater status, people give you more things. They help you more. They treat you better. They help you more, basically. Often when they don't even need it. You know who the people who are treated best in this country? The people who are helped the most by governments, by everybody? Rich people, powerful people, elected officials. They're the ones who need, who, who need the help least, but they're the people who are treated the best because that's what happens when you have social status. People treat you better and you treat other, better, other people better too so that you can gain even more status. So they can think that you are nice and wonderful and then they treat you even better. So it's kind of reciprocal as well. Sad but true, but that's why a lot of people do this. And it is sad, I think, that we treat the people the best who don't even need it. And the people who do need it are not the ones who get treated the best. The ones who need it most are the ones who get the least. That's the sad thing about our society. And speaking of those that are needy, right? Um, another reason why uh, we help, of course, is because, well, not another reason, but this has to do with the goal of gaining status and approval, right? We help so, so we can raise our status and get social approval. Okay, we get more social approval when we raise our status, but sometimes we just want approval. And in order to get approval, we need to follow the norms. The norm of social responsibility is one such norm, right? It's also called the helping norm. The helping norm or the social responsibility norm says that, you know, we should help those who need our assistance. What it says is that if we can help, we should help those in need. That's what it says. We should help those in need. That's the social responsibility norm. We are better off, so we should help those that are worse off. That's the social responsibility norm. And if you follow the norm, if you behave this way, you're more likely to be approved of. People are more likely to think that you're nice and wonderful, right? You help the needy. You help those in need, right? If you don't help those in need, right? If you're stingy and mean and you don't help children, you don't help the poor, you don't help those in need, People don't look at you very kindly, especially, if, I mean, if they know about it, right? Like, especially if you're rich and wealthy and you don't give a dime, let's say, to charities or to, organ or to organizations that help people, right? They look at you as stingy and mean, like what the hell's wrong with you? Um, or even in general, right? If you're someone of means and somebody asks you for some help, they know you can help. They know you, you have money and you have status and, you know, resources and you still don't help you that you still don't help them it makes you look bad and we know who those people are usually in our family right those that are making it so to speak those that are doing well and um you know and sometimes those people don't follow the social responsibility norm you know i uh i have a family still in el salvador you know where people are pretty poor compared to the u.s okay and we have family members in need. And those of us here in the US are doing better, especially those of, those of us who are younger, who are the later generation, who have now gone on to college and now have decent jobs, right? We should help those in need. We should help those less fortunate, especially if they are our family members, right? You know what happens? Most of us don't, right? A lot of people do, by the way, a lot of people here in the U.S., even if they don't have great jobs, they're doing a little bit better than they would be, let's say, in Mexico or in El Salvador, where I'm from, or other countries, and a lot of them do help and do send money back, a lot of money back, by the way, not, I mean, to those countries. As a matter of fact, Mexico, El Salvador, a lot of Latin American countries, a lot of countries in general um, receive a lot of money, billions of dollars every year, just from relatives sending from people sending money back to their relatives to help them out. And we should help those in need, those that are worse off in our own society, but even our family members. But there are some people who don't, and those people look stingy, they look mean, they look bad. Okay. And even in my own family, you know, there are those who choose to help and there are those who don't. 
Okay. I told you guys before, I have a cousin, you know, he's over there. He's trying to raise his kids and stuff like that. He actually has a decent job. He's a teacher over there, but they pay them so poorly and they cut his pay in half because of COVID. And, uh, you know, he can't make ends meet anymore because they cut his pay in half. So we have to kind of help him. Some of us do and some of us don't. Those of us that follow the social responsibility norm, we look better. People think more highly of us. They see us as nicer, more kind, more generous people, right? We get more social approval, but we should follow the norm. We should help those who need our help. If we can help, we should help. Not everybody does though. Okay, um, more about social status and approval of bystanders. Let's talk about the effect of bystanders. This is really gonna get us to, into some of the really important stuff uh, to help you understand helping. The bystander effect, right, is the tendency to be less likely to help in an emergency if there are other onlookers present. So there's a situation, something happens to someone, somebody needs help, and there are several people there. The bystander effect says that chances are uh, people are not gonna help because there's other people there. So in other words, it's, you know, why should you help? There's other people there, right? It's not you who has to help. You're not the only one there. So often you do not help. It's the bystander effect. And yes, it does have to do with gaining social status and approval, okay? Uh, because we tend to follow the norms and you'll see that the norms in this case are not very helpful. Here, we're just talking about the effect. We'll talk about why it happens in a moment, but. It's the tendency to fail to help when there's other people present. Somebody needs help, there's several people there and often no one will help this person. Why is that? That's called the bystander effect, the bystander, the bystander effect. You're an innocent bystander. You happen to witness something and you're not the only one there. There's other bystanders and you don't help. Most likely you will not help is what the research says. Why is that, okay? And here's an experiment to show that this does happen. An experiment was done. A female experimenter, she had people waiting for a research study in a laboratory. She had this waiting room, she had people waiting for the study to begin. They didn't know that the study had already started. That's part of the experiment. Because she went next door and she pretended to have fallen off a chair. She pretended to see if they would help her. She pretended to have fallen off a chair. And she moaned, right? Cried out in pain, oh, my foot, my ankle, right? Sometimes participants were waiting alone and sometimes they were waiting with others. Those waiting alone, 70% of them helped. 70% of them went next door to find out what was going on. Of course, they learned that, you know, it was, they, help wasn't really needed, but at least they would have helped had it been a real emergency, right? In this case, it was just an experiment. 70% of them, most of them helped when they were waiting alone. But when they were waiting with others, when people were waiting with other people who were present, only 13% of them helped. Most of them did nothing. That's the bystander effect right there. There's other people present and you don't help. You can, but you don't. Why does this happen? Why is it that when there's more people, we're less likely to help? Of course, some obvious reasons come to mind and we'll get to those. One of those reasons is diffusion of responsibility. You feel less responsible, that's what that means. Responsibility is diffused. You see, when you're the only one there and someone needs help, you're responsible. You're the only one there. If there's just one person and it's you, you're 100% responsible. If there's two people there, now you're only 50% responsible. If there's four people there, 25%. If there's more people there, your responsibility goes down and you know it. You don't even have to do the math. You just know there's other people here. I don't have to do anything. It's not my job. It's not my responsibility. Somebody else is gonna help. So it's the, it's the tendency of bystanders to dilute personal responsibility for acting because others are present. Others are present, people, feel don't people don't feel as responsible. An example, bystanders to an emergency may assume someone else will call the police, right? Something happens, maybe some woman's getting robbed or somebody's getting beaten up or something like that. 
There's several people there witnessing this. People will often assume somebody's going to call the police. Somebody else is going to help. I don't have to do anything. The problem is that often nobody does anything. That's the problem. Everyone assumes the same thing. Everyone feels less responsible. And sometimes nobody does anything. And it's happened. People have gotten robbed, killed, beaten up in broad daylight, and nobody helped. It happens. See, um, the thing is that uh, social psychologists didn't think of this on their own. They noticed that this actually happens in the real world. And then they wonder, why does this happen? And then they do an experiment, and then they find out that it's actually the norm. This is actually what happens most of the time. And they want to find out why. And that's, what, that's where the research comes from in this case. Because people notice these things, that people get hurt, killed, robbed, whatever it is. No one calls the police. Nobody helps. And then people are afterward are kind of like outraged. Like, what the hell? You know, what's wrong with people? Why don't they help? Right? And it's like social psychologists study this, and they find out that's the way most people are. That's the way we behave when other people are present. Okay? Another reason they don't help is because of pluralistic ignorance. Ignorance. In other words, they assume the wrong things. There's a tendency of bystanders to give misleading cues to one another that no help is needed. In action, being poised, right? Help is needed, let's say. Well, somebody collapses, help is needed, let's say. And they all look at each other. Everyone's just looking at each other. No one's doing anything. So they assume that it's not a big deal, that they shouldn't do anything because nobody's acting. They're all trying to kind of figure out the situation, so to speak, looking at each other. Nobody seems particularly bothered or worried. Nobody's acting. So they assume that, eh, maybe I don't have to do anything either. That's pluralistic ignorance. And it's ignorance because, yes, you should do something. Help is needed, but you often don't help because you mislead each other, right? You follow each other's cues. You follow the norm, so to speak. The norm is that no one's helping, so you do the same thing. You're more likely to help if you're the only one there because then people don't give you misleading information with their body language or with whatever they're failing to do. That's another reason people don't help. And by the way, I just wanna point out in case it's you who needs help, if you're in a, in a situation where you need help, right? And you want people to help you, you have to deal with these things, okay? If there's several people there, or actually just in general, it may be hard to get help. People are not going to feel responsible for you, confusion of responsibility, and people are also likely to assume that they don't need to help you. Maybe that you're going to be okay or that somebody else is going to help you. And if you're the one who needs help, you need to know about this so that you can get out of this, so you can get the help you need. You have to fight these things, right? You have to fight the diffusion of responsibility. How do you do that? You have to make people feel responsible. If you want help, right? Nobody's helping you. Make them feel responsible. How do you do that? Look at them. Point at them and say, I am talking to you. Will you help me? Make them feel responsible. And even then, many times they'll say, no, I can't help you. I'm sorry. I can't. I have to go or whatever it is. Make them feel responsible. And if that person doesn't help, then go to the next one. What about you? Will you help me? Make them feel responsible. And then pluralistic ignorance. Sometimes they assume no help is needed or that somebody else is gonna help you, right? Uh, the way you fight that is make it clear that you need help. Say, I need help, right? Please help me, right? It's, this is an emergency. Make it clear, right? And that's the way you fight that. You have to know this. And even when you know this, by the way, and you use the, these tactics, it can still be difficult to get help. I've been there, right? I've been there. I, I know uh, how it can be. Even, and I was already aware of this because I teach this stuff, okay? And uh, still, um, you know, it was hard to get help, but I did get help eventually. Another study was done where uh, that's to do with bystanders, a study in which researchers pumped smoke into a lab while students filled out a questionnaire. So students were, again, in a kind of a waiting room, and they were filling out a questionnaire, and the researchers pump smoke into that room, you know, basically uh, like trying to suggest that, uh, or trying to make it seem like maybe there's a fire, okay? 
Sometimes participants were alone when this was happening. And sometimes there were with two other real participants who were filling out these questionnaires with them. Sometimes they were with two other, what are called confederates. Those are fake participants, right? Those are people who are not really participants. They're part of the study. I don't know the story of why they call them confederates. It probably has, does have something to do with the confederacy, right? And the, you know, yes, that history probably does have to do with that. Maybe they're considered, uh, you know, traitors or just people who are not on your side or whatever it is. I think it's because they're not on your side. Maybe they call them that. Uh, anyway, these people pretend that there was nothing wrong. So they're giving misleading information, okay? And this is what happened. The percentage reporting the smoke, the percentage who basically, you know, got up and tried to tell someone, hey, there's smoke here, there might be a fire. Helping, in other words, right? You don't have to do much to help. Sometimes all you have to do is report the problem. When participants were alone, close to 80% of them actually helped. When they were with two real other people, less than half actually helped. And then when they were with two other people who pretended nothing was wrong, 10% of them, about 10% of them helped, right? People are giving misleading cues. Sure, you're more likely to ignore the situation, ignore the problem, pretend nothing is wrong. And I've been in that very kind of situation. I actually was in a building once where I saw smoke and it smelled like stuff was burning. And there were other people there holding office hours, pretending nothing was wrong. You know, because no one's doing anything. Yeah, it smells a bit funny in here. And I noticed that. And I said, there's no way. There's something wrong here. I called it in. I did that, right? So to speak, uh, even though other people were not doing this, right? Why? Because I already know about this, right? I know it's important to still help, even if other people may be misleading you about that, right? You need to be aware of what's going on and still report it just in case, even if it is not a big deal, even if it's a false alarm, right? You need to help just in case. And it turns out it was a real fire, right? So people look to others to provide information. And when people give the wrong information or misleading information, it may cause you not to help. Um, more about bystanders, right? And social approval. Um, Sometimes people assume that help would be seen as an unwelcome intrusion. Sometimes people don't help because they wanna, for instance, mind their own business. They don't wanna get involved, okay? Sometimes that's why people don't get involved. Study was done, an experiment was done where a woman was fighting with another man, fighting with a man, okay? It was fake, but it was an experiment, okay? Sometimes the woman yelled out, I don't even know you, right? And they're fighting. And another time she yelled out, I don't know why I marry you. Basically saying, this is, you know, this is, you know, part of my family, or this is someone who I'm married to. This is my spouse or whatever it is. Help, of course, was more likely in the first case. I don't even know you, right? You're more likely to get help as opposed to you're having an argument or a fight with someone who is your spouse, right? Your brother, your sister, your husband, your wife, right? Most people are likely to assume like, hey, none of my business, let them deal with it. I'm not getting involved, not getting in that mess. And I've had many arguments with that, you know, with my wife and stuff like that. Some of them, some of them have gotten heated and, you know, and sometimes uh, a few times things have been thrown, nothing broken, but sometimes things have been thrown. I'm glad my neighbors right, don't get involved and end up calling the cops and getting me arrested. I haven't done anything bad, okay, anything wrong. But sometimes, yes, we've had some really bad arguments, right? Cussing and things like that. And most neighbors will kind of leave you alone. Say, hey, it's their business, right? Let them deal with it. Sometimes you can hear that it gets really bad and sometimes people do get involved. But many times they will not and they will not report it because they basically assume none of my business, I should not get involved right? I don't want to get into that mess. Social approval, the norm is that you mind your own business. But if you do hear stuff where it sounds really bad, where it sounds like things are being thrown, or it sounds like things are being broken, and it sounds like there's a real physical fight going on, you should do something. You should call, okay? And just to tell you, here where we live, 
uh, the most uh, common thing that is reported to police is actually domestic violence, just so you know. That's the kind of place we live in, okay? It's actually one of the places that has the highest rates of domestic violence, right? So let's keep going. So here's the way it works if you put it into a kind of a flow chart here. The effect of onlookers on the decision uh, to help. First, they, they see others as sources of help, right? So I don't have to help, there's other people here. They see others of sources of whether help is called for, right? They look at others to determine whether they should help or not. And then they also see others as of sources of approval or disapproval for helping, right? Should I get involved, right? Should I help here? Well, well is this the right thing to do? Or should I mind my own business? Will I, will I be disapproved of for getting involved in some domestic dispute? All that factors into the helping decision. Let's keep going. Um, another reason why we uh, help is because we want the need for approval. Uh, according to research, those that score higher on the need for approval actually donate more money, but only if the donation is public, in which case they are buying approval. Need for approval, this is actually a personality dimension, a personality thing. There's actually a questionnaire where you answer several questions and they can, and then the researchers can then score it and say, oh, you're high in need for approval or you're somewhere in the middle or you're lower in need for approval. Those that have a greater need for others to think well of them, they ha they're higher in need for approval. They are more likely to donate money to charity or donate more money to charity when other people are looking, when it's public, right? Not in private, not when other people don't know about it. So it's like they're buying other people's approval. If you have, if you're lower in need for approval, then you don't really care as much whether people think well of you or not, and you're gonna donate what you think is right regardless. Another thing that has to do with helping is also uh, population density. Population density, okay? Turns out that helping is less likely in densely packed cities. If you live in a big city where there's a lot more people, you're more likely to be ignored less likely to be helped because people pay less attention to those around them in these cities when there's more population density because of stimulus overload. You live in this big city, there's a lot of noise, a lot of chaos, a lot of traffic, a lot of stuff. There's a lot of things that you have to get used to and what you do over time in order to function well in that society is you need to tune things out so that you don't get so stressed out. And we also learn to tune people out and we're less likely to help them when we live in big cities, if that's what we're used to. If we live in a smaller community, less people, right? You're more likely to be helped in those kinds of situations because there people are more likely to know each other, more likely to help each other. Um, they're more likely to notice when things happen and pay attention because things may not happen that often in that, you know, uh, in that uh, type of place, right? It's a more of a rural community, there's less people, not a lot happens there, right? Not a lot of crime, not a lot of stuff. And basically people are aware of more of what's happening around them because there's just less that happens. They don't have to tune things out. Gender matters as well, okay? When it comes to helping, turns out that uh, men and women are different. Women are more likely to help those that they already know. Women are less likely to help strangers for very obvious reasons, right? Uh, strangers can be dangerous, more dangerous to women than they are to men. So women are actually more likely to help than men if it's people they already know. If you need help, right? And you know certain people, right? You're more likely to get help from women than you are from guys, okay? From males. Women are nicer in that way. But men are more likely to help in situations that are more female, uh, Men, oh, oh, not men. Okay, we're not yet on the men part. Women are also more likely to help in female typical situations. They're more likely to help you, for instance, if you need nurturance, support, a shoulder to cry on, someone to talk to you, to talk to, they're more likely to help you. Men, not so likely to help you with those sorts of things. Okay. Men are actually more likely to help than women if we're talking about strangers. Men are more likely to help people they don't know than women are and more likely to help in emergency situations that may be dangerous. 
right? Men are more likely to, to do that than women. And then men are also more likely to help in male typical situations. Men are more likely to help in situations that are dangerous, where more force is required, where it's more instrumental, more about fixing a tire or helping you fix the car to get on the road or help give you a lift because your car is broken down. Men are more likely to help you in those kinds of situations than women for obvious reasons. First of all, men like those kinds of things more and men are not as vulnerable as women are in those kinds of situations with strangers. Men are bigger and stronger on average. Women are usually smaller and weaker and they can be more easily taken advantage of and more easily hurt if that person who needs help might be faking it and might just be trying to prey on you in some way, okay? All right, uh, the next part is about managing self-image, but I think we'll stop there. We've gotten far enough, so I will stop recording. <laughs>